Achtung, Achtung. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Today, we've got a fantastic treat for you. Our latest audiobook is called Those Devils in Baggy Pants, and it tells the story of life in the US 82nd Airborne Division. The author, Ross S. Carter, took part in every major campaign featuring the 504th Parachute Infantry from Sicily in 1943 through to Germany in May 1945. It's a cracking read, and it's been beautifully read for us by the American actor and great friend of this podcast, Chaz Mina. The first chapter is here, and if you enjoy it, the rest of the book will be released day by day on our independent company site. In fact, episode two is up there already. So thanks again to the brilliant Chaz Mina. Here is Those Devils in Baggy Pants. <laughs> Those Devils in Baggy Pants by Ross S. Carter Read by Chaz Mena Preface Through luck, fate, or whatever you want to call it, I find myself again a civilian after three years of comradeship and blood and death in the 504th Parachute Infantry of the 82nd Airborne Division. My friends call me a refugee from the law of averages, My regiment still exists as a name, but the regiment in which I trained, fought, and almost died in now lies buried in obscure army cemeteries in ten countries. Like the ancient mariner, I feel compelled to tell a tale of brave and loyal men who are not alive to tell their own tale. I do not propose to tell you a sentimentalized or humorous yarn, although there will be sentiment and humor and many tearful moments in it. The dead men who will come to life in this book were, for the most part, tough, fibered, hard-living, and reckless. But no braver, more loyal, and better fighting men ever lived. I well remember a Saturday afternoon in North Africa when I was drinking cognac and wine with two scarred veterans of the French Foreign Legion. One, a murderer from Holland. The other, an embezzler from France. Their lives were behind them, and their future was to die for causes and for a country which meant nothing to them. I, too, belong to a legion of doomed men, but death is less bitter when the alternative is slavery. See, most of us knew what we were fighting for, and we knew how to fight. The one thing that people noticed about men of the legion, that's a name I'll sometimes use to designate our outfit, and that thing has been impressed upon them many times, often with violence, was the flaming wildness of their spirit. People used to wonder why we were wilder than other soldiers, and I can tell you. The thing that distinguished us from most other soldiers was our willingness to take chances and risks in a branch of the army that provided a great new and almost unexplored frontier. In other days, paratroopers would have been the type of men to sail with Columbus or the the first to seek out the West and fight the Indians. Men joined the paratroopers because they couldn't resist the awful thrill of risking their life in a parachute. They were drawn into the outfit as by a magnet, and, once in, wouldn't have left it if they got the chance. Each man had supreme faith in his ability to take care of himself, whatever the odds. For this reason, paratroopers were at times a quarrelsome lot, because they could never believe that anybody could beat the hell out of them. Every level of society had its representation among us, Senators' sons rubbed shoulders with ex-cowboys. Steel workers chumped up with tough guys from the city slums. Farm boys, millionaire-spoiled brats, white-collar men, factory workers, ex-convicts, jailbirds, and even hobos joined the thrill and adventure of parachute jumping. And so the Army's largest collection of, uh, adventurous men congregated in the parachute troops. Now, the 82nd, which landed by boat at Casablanca on May 11, 1943, was the first airborne division activated and sent overseas to join the Allied Expeditionary Forces. Two parachute regiments, of 504th and 505th, and one regiment of glider troops, the 325th. These were the principal units of the division. Although there were several battalions of parachute and glider engineers, a quartermaster unit, a parachute maintenance unit... Division, headquarters unit, etc. And when the 82nd went into Normandy, the 508th Parachute Regiment was attached to the division, and still is. The 504th in Italy, all winter on special duty with the 5th Army, did not reach England until shortly before D-Day. 
At that time, we were too crippled and too poorly equipped for the Normandy invasion. The 507th Regiment, which substituted in Normandy for the 504th, was separated from the 82nd after that mission, and the 504th returned to the division fold. Major General Matthew Ridgway was the division commander in training and overseas until the 18th Airborne Corps was formed, which included the 82nd, 101, 17th, and 13th Airborne Divisions. The 18th Airborne Corps was part of the 1st Allied Airborne Army under the command of Lieutenant General Brereton. The British had two Airborne Divisions in their part of the Army, the 1st and the 6th, plus the Polish Parachute Brigade. General Gavin became division commander of the 82nd after the formation of the 18th Airborne Corps. A history of the 504th Parachute Regiment has been written, and a military history will be about the 82nd Airborne Division. What I am writing is not a military history, but an eyewitness participated in the count, the human story of men who fought the enemy to a standstill in many bloody battles all over Europe. I missed only 40-some-odd days of duty with the regiment in three years, and so was there, and all of these incidents happened. Chapter 1. The Beer for Duquesne. At retreat one afternoon, the captain bellowed, Men, tomorrow we are going to jump out in Andy's field, and after we will assemble and get our chutes rolled up, and we are going on a maneuver and storm old Cooley Conk Hill again. The problem is strictly tactical, and there will be no goofing off on the job. Then the top kick beat his gums and told us that Reveille would be at 8 o'clock, and that he didn't give a damn where we went or what we did just as so we were there at Reveille. We got passes for town, which for us was the town pump in Fayetteville, where we drank a few beers in honor of the jump to be made the next day. Each of us had butterflies in the stomach we always did before a jump. We toasted each other for luck, hoping that the chutes would open and that nobody's hurt would be more than strawberries, that is, skin places on the neck, which we often get as the chute opens. We drank the town pump dry, and most of us went home early, not wanting to have a bad hangover, which makes it harder to go out the door. Just the same, next morning, many had fuzzy beer heads and furry beer mouths. Duquesne. Duke as we call the gray-haired old lumberjack, army age 27, real age 43. He was not at Reveille. We concluded that he must have had one drink too many. He was about to be turned in missing when all of a sudden we see him lone rangering toward us in no bicycle. Streamed up, bareheaded, his gray hair sticking to his rugged brown face, and when he turned his head to look at us, his bike charged a telephone pole and ricocheted him on his chin, belly, and knees to his place in the ranks. We rolled in the dirt, laughing, tickled to death at him because he was such a lovable guy, always in his cups and full of fun. Oh, he had an awful hangover. Those of us in my plane got together and decided we would yell after our chutes opened. A beer for Duquesne in honor of his lone ranger stunt. We went to our planes, our bellies tickling with the old familiar butterfly feeling. And on the way, Lossick, a lean, happy-go-lucky Polak, kept ribbing Duquesne, who for once was in no mood for horseplay. Polak was a good guy. Other than overeating, oversleeping, or counting his money, he never spent a nickel spontaneously. He had no observable weaknesses. The tension mounted as the moment to jump approached. Our nerves were as vibrating as wind-strummed telephone wires. Suddenly we began leaving the plane, and as the line moved fast toward the door, I sealed my mind to the blankness. My chute opened fast, happy, contented, thrilled, knowing that I was in the best outfit in the army. I yelled, A beer for Duquesne! And floated down like a giant snowflake. (sighs) Landed unhurt, rolled up my chute, walked over to join Carlton, a tall, gray-eyed Texan whose face was ashen. Drawn. What's wrong? I was the second man out. I was about to yell, a beer for Duquesne, when something bulleted past me, uttering horrible screams. It was Lossick, falling like a rock, with a chute stringing out above him. I saw him hit and bounce several feet and lay quiet. Officers soon broke up the group of enlisted men clustered around Lossick and screamed him from us until the ambulance carried him away. 
I will not tell you here what an 800-foot fall will do to a man. I'll let your imagination figure it out. We felt very bad in our hearts and in our stomachs as we worked out the tactical problem of storming old Cooley Conk. Our minds and feeling of comradeship were back there on the jump field at Lossick. Could have been one of us, but wasn't. We learned that he was the only man in the battalion who didn't have insurance. Nobody would sleep in his empty bunk, so we moved it out and brought in a new one. The new man never knew who slept in that spot. My platoon furnished him a guard of honor at the morgue. The army put him in a fine casket, and we never got to look at him again, or did we want to, preferring to remember him alive. The next day, we had a military funeral. Our company, serving as official mourners, followed him about half a mile to the church where he was given a Catholic burial service. The army band played and wailing music that, well, that cut our hearts. After the Catholic service was over, three Polacks from his town formed a guard of honor on the train to his home. Thus passed the first member of the Legion. After the funeral, we all sat around glumly, each juggling his own bleak thoughts, concreted in his own private little hell. Finally, a poker game and a crap game got going. Nobody gave a damn whether he won or lost. And that night, we formed a a group in a corner of the post exchange to drink a beer and, and ended up singing the paratrooper song of death. Cause he ain't gonna jump no more. Sung to the tune of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. It is a very moving song, lugubrious like an Indian death chant. But no man thought of getting out of the outfit because Lossick got his. We were bound to it by forces bigger than ourselves. Chapter 2 The Kangaroo Rat Went to Spanish Morocco We were bivouacked in the desert about two miles from Ouijda in French Morocco, a hellhole if ever there was one. Five hundred of us living in pup tents out on the level desert. The sun rose in the morning, hung in the sky like a glaring copper ball, and sat looking the same. The desert hard as a rock, our water supply scanty, about a quart of drinking water per day, if you got there in time to get your ration. Although we tried at first, we couldn't keep clean, so we finally gave up. We set to hell with it and stayed dirty most of the time. The wind blew sand in our mess kits and into our food. Uh, Millions of flies densely specked the air. We all got dysentery, known in the army as GIs, and other plainer terms. We would scoot about the desert all night and then go to bed before daylight. As soon as the sun came up, we roasted inside our tents, so we rarely got any sleep. About eight o'clock, some chicken supply sergeant would fall us out to draw some trifling piece of equipment, and then again before lunch, and then once more before supper. Between times, some officer would lecture us on military courtesy and discipline. We sat in a daze, hoping he would fall dead and have his guts eaten out by dysentery or some other minor ailment. Then about sunset, we'd go out into the desert again and play war games all night. Get stuck full of cactus thorns, lose our tempers, fill our guns up with dirt so we would have something to do the next day. One morning, we were sitting about doing nothing, just as we always did. Some guys had on only their boots, others no more than their boots and a cap, or boots and a shirt, or boots and shorts, or boots and a helmet. Just couldn't spot a pair of pants on anybody. So 500 boys stood around in nearly nothing, panting like lizards, all bored with no place to go and nothing to do or read. We'd even gotten tired of talking about women, and that is a bad sign in the army. Well, that was the picture up to the moment when some joker, wearing only boots and a helmet, while strolling about the desert, a short distance from the tents, like Lawrence of Arabia, stirred up a peculiar little creature known to zoology as a kangaroo rat. The rat was about the size of a gray squirrel, with hind legs as big as the rest of him. His forefeet were small and weak, his long mousy nose inset with beady eyes resembling a pair of pushed black spectacles gave him one hell of a funny look. 
The tail was long and bushy and waved like a red fox's as he bounced in volleys on ten-foot leaps. So the rat took off with the lunkhead who stirred him up, yelping after him like a foxhound. Five hundred men jumped up. Five hundred men yelped joyously. Five hundred nude men tore off into the desert. The little rat peered over his shoulder, saw with horror the mighty stampede, and really began to get the hell out of there. He would take four or five big jumps, then hit and run a few steps. I don't know what he was thinking, but I know he didn't like it. When he looked back, which was often, he could see 500 men coming like a herd of stampeding buffaloes, tearing the sandy air with wild yells and kicking up a vast cloud of choking dust. With good sense, therefore, the little rat headed straight to Spanish Morocco. Maybe he knew that Spain was neutral. The battalion commander, a little sawed-off guy about 29, was sitting in his tent catching up on his paperwork when he heard the bedlam break out. He ran out of the tent, and there, a quarter of a mile away, saw his command, apparently gone crazy, heading for a neutral country. Maybe to be interned for the duration, he didn't waste any time peeling off after his men, all still running hard, and some of them even gaining on the rat, which apparently hadn't gotten his second win yet. There leaped the rat out in front, and then came the battalion, breathing hard and beginning to string out like racehorses in the last lap, and after the battalion came the little colonel, who didn't know the score, but was afraid of losing his command. He was running hell-bent to get it back. The rat, at last, got a second wind, or maybe his third, for suddenly convinced that he was in real jeopardy. He put on a burst of speed that left its stampede behind as if marking time. Finally, he disappeared in the distance, still headed for Spanish Morocco, and there he probably is today. Unless the chase shortened his life, or unless, homesick, he went back to rejoin his family, if he had one. The men... Wind-blown and tired, feeling foolish for raising so much hell over a rat, turned around and started back with the colonel ahead of them, who was shaking his head from side to side and mumbling to himself. Up to that time, Berlin Betty, who broadcast to us in English and seemed to know all about us, had called us Colonel Fill-in-the-Blank Glamour Boys, because we were paratroopers. And then she caught wind of the rat episode, and she began calling us Colonel, fill in the blanks, Desert Rats. We, the Desert Rats? We would listen to her, thinking what damn fools we were. That's it for those devils in baggy pants today. Tune in tomorrow for more. Fantastic. Thanks, Chaz. The rest of the audiobook is free to members of the independent company over on our Patreon, and the second instalment is up on the site already. A reminder, it's patreon.com slash wehaveways. See you all.